Hey everybody, what's up? Happy Wednesday, happy hump day. We're here having some wisdom with my friend Mel's. And, um, you know, Mel's, you have a really interesting background in e-commerce and I can't wait to learn from you. Um, and every time I do one of these interviews, I am super excited about uh, you know, learning. This is why I love doing these interviews because I love to learn. Um, so Melz, if we can start off with you just telling us a little bit about you and what you do and how you got into this e-commerce game. Yeah, I was, uh, I had a tech company uh, that we started in 20, uh, 2009 and then I got fired from my own company in 2012. And it was a, that was a, that was a devastating event. Um, and we had 70 people in five countries in, 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 in two years. So it was a very fast growing thing. Um, but my, I had three partners. So it was my biggest mistake and they kicked me out and I was the, the, the CEO of the company. So I lost all my money at nothing. So then they go into a scrap gold business. So I was, I was, I was like a friend of mine were, were in that, in that, in that business. And it was the, the gold price was very high. So I was buying and selling scrap gold. And then I saw that there was like uh, the, the, the gold, actually, there was very good jewelry that we got into the store. So I decided like, hey, maybe we can just refurbish it and sell it. And that's what I did. So I had two physical stores. I still have them in the Netherlands. Uh, it's not one. We, we moved back to one. But um, uh, and then we started selling them online. And that was my my and re-entrying back into e-commerce. That was 2014, uh, 2013, actually. And then. I, I got online uh, because I got not a lot of my knowledge I got from from like networks and, and masterminds. And so I got online and I was in a group with Ezra Firestone. And then Ezra Firestone sent an email. He said, you know, there's some guys that are making like $100,000 a month from their basement. And I'm like, dude, I'm an entrepreneur for way too long to actually believe any of this shit. So, but anyway, I signed up for the course, ASM3, and um, I got in. And, what um, was it called? It was ASM, ASM. Amazing. ASM3. ASM3. So yeah. Oh my gosh. So and that, that was that was like I was following the course. I'm like, there's only one way to find out that it doesn't work or does work, right? So just try it. So I set myself a goal. I signed up on April, uh, April 20, 2014, and then uh, you know did go through the course and like grab the product. Gold and silver was not a good idea, so I picked another product just for the sake of testing. And um, I said to myself, if I sell for ten thousand dollars in 2014, this will be something that will stay and we continue for the for the future my first sale was actually end of september 2014 and i did um a hundred thousand dollars in revenue in 2014 it's like wow this is definitely more than i expected so this seems to work so then in 2015 we set a goal of our i set a goal was alone with like like two vas uh set a goal like oh, what if you can do one million dollars and it was 2.4 million dollars so then i was like okay no more goal setting we just like <laughs> wing it and go like, full in and uh, and that's what we did so yeah that's basically how i got into e-commerce um and then and then in 20, 2016 we we used a lot of software tools back then and and those were the golden ages i mean uh, you know you you could literally buy reviews online on fiverr and we never yeah. did that right never but <laughs> anyway not. <laughs> it was it was it was still it was all possible and um but yeah we were using a lot of tools and then we, we actually wanted to do more so we started building our own mm -hmm. software tools so i had a background in tech so we started making stuff and um and using it for our own brands and that helped us a lot into gaining advantage and then then we put it into a suite and then we called it in tel aviv and then we got a mastermind together in 2018. i was actually introduced to masterminding in 2015. I paid twenty five thousand dollars on Jason Fledlin and Ben Cummings in in a mastermind. It was like, what? what is that? Why paying so much? If it's expensive, it must be good. So I paid, and it was great. I had like a, a few a few friends I met there. Still have very good contact with them. And then in twenty sixteen, I was like, what is the next level? And it was another mastermind costing a hundred thousand dollars a year. So I'm like, okay, let's do it. And I did. Uh, that actually failed because because well the the organization was not that that good. There was some conflict between the owners. And then in 2018 we started our own. So and then we dumped the software suite into the the uh, into the mastermind. So we had our own mastermind uh, with uh, three leaders and now back to uh, six leaders and now back to three leaders. And um, and we got a group of close friends that were like like members of that as well. So that was a kind of a nice nice way of getting in touch with a lot of other sellers and getting. Uh, all the knowledge that we needed and um but actually we decided to open up in tel aviv uh, last year 2022 uh because this is something that we invested millions and millions of dollars in and now we're also having a SaaS 
which is in Tel Aviv. So yeah, that's basically my my short version of the story of like how I got into e-com and what I'm doing today. Wow. You know, you got into e-commerce during the good old days when oh, <laughs> you could just launched something and it just flew. I started in 2007, um, you know, and that was, it was just me flipping my textbooks and stuff. I didn't like, I wasn't doing it as a full-time business, you know, but, um, but either way, it just looked so much different in 2017 when I started my private label brand. I couldn't believe how much Amazon had grown and all the softwares that had launched. And, you know, none of that stuff was available in, in 2007. We were just on the Amazon seller app. And even that was, you know, cool <laughs> back then because, you know, you're like, oh, okay, this is how I do this. But yeah. um, it was very elementary back then. And I just... I remember entering in 2017 and going, wow, like this, this has really changed and there's so much to learn. And, you know, there was, there was so much. So, and now, you know, here in 2023, which is what we're talking about today, uh, it's changed so much. I, I mean, I was just at Southern Cellar Fest in Australia and I was telling people, you know, I used to be able to speak with authority on the latest tactics, like what, what are we doing? What do I recommend you do? I've been using the same launch strategy for three years and it was working so well and it was just a, a home run. And now it's really hard to say that any, any strategy is solid because there's so many changes happening on Amazon. And that has been very, very, uh, frustrating because you just, you, you don't know right now. It's like Amazon's constantly changing things and tinkering and uh, moving things around. So um, yeah, I, <laughs> I think it's, it's really tough now to do anything in 2023 and know for sure that it's a solid strategy. Every time I log into seller central um, something has changed. So what do you think about that Mel's? Um, what do you think about that in terms of, of changes on Amazon? And what are your recommendations? What are you seeing today that is working? This is a very long topic. We, we can talk about it. Like what, the changes, like since 2012, we've seen, uh, 2013, we've seen uh, things changing. Like even if you talk to the people that were in the old days, like you said, 20, 2007, every year there's more changes. And Amazon is ramping up a lot, right? Um, and, and, you know, what we have been doing as well since 2016 is following the Amazon algorithm. So we found out that the Amazon A9 is actually driving the search, right? And then it came with the ads and then it was not there before. And in the beginning it was like, wow, something new is coming. And that evolved a lot into what it is today. And now Amazon becomes way more pay to play than it was before, right? Um, you cannot do it without PPC. I still know a few people, big sellers, by the way, that don't spend a dime on PPC. It would be amazing, but they don't spend a dime on PPC. I don't know how they do it, but it's great. Um, but yeah, everything changed so fast. And if you if you looked at the algorithm, so we started following the trends in the algorithm and we did it for one purpose because we said, okay, if I go where the puck is, meaning everybody has the strategies that work today and everybody jumps on that and every, everybody pays for courses and they say, let's do what everybody is doing. But by the time that it some some great strategies are airing and you you hear about it like everybody else hears about it right so there's maybe if you act fast at best you have an advantage of like a couple of months and then all your competitors do exactly the same thing so advantage is gone so instead of like moving looking to the past right we thought like what if we could look into the future what will happen in the future and we started digging into the Amazon A9 documents in the patents and we found out who, who, which people were actually responsible for what. And then we started following them around and we knew that they were speaking on certain events about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we attended a few of those events uh, uh, back in the days and continue to do that along the years. And then Amazon.Science came along and they had these documents that they, that, they, that they sent, which before that was much harder to find. You need to know the name and then you could find those documents. Now they actually put it in one giant uh, pool, which is Amazon.Science. Nice to 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 watch, uh, look around there, and it's it's a lot of technical mumbo jumbo, right? So you, so you need to cut to the clutter, but even now you can upload them in Chat GPT and ask questions, and they will ask you in normal uh, language what it actually means. Which is and you're also saying great. this was called Amazon.Science. 
Amazon.science, yeah. If you go to Amazon.science, a lot of lot of publications are there. And the essence of the, the documents is because Amazon, um, it, it, they has a scientific uh, part, right, where they collaborate with people from Google, people from Yahoo, people from um, uh, other big companies, uh, even international, like the Temus, uh, um, the, the, the QQs from, from China. Everything that's related to search, everything that's related to voice control, it's, it's a lot of... All the technical things, all the, the technology you see in Amazon, they they talk about it. They have people and scientists that are involved in like groups that have even work outside of Amazon. Even with the AWS, right? that's, that's a whole different uh, portal of Amazon. But anyways, they they write about it and they write essays and they write like, like scientific papers. And they write these scientific papers in order to, and many times this is a pitch for like some kind of an event, like like Seagear, CIKML, uh, those events that 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 are where machine learning uh, scientists and artificial intelligence scientists are coming together. And uh, so, so th but there's a lot of value in these scientific documents. You can, by following the trends and listening to the talks and attending to those events, um, we we learned a ton about where Amazon was going. So we learned about the problems that they had. We learned about the challenges we, knew, we learned about like uh, the things that they improved and if it worked or not worked how they actually test things out um and that led us to the trails of like following uh, the breadcrumbs of like related to search and and we studied that thing and i think we well we kind of became uh i'm not saying specialists because we're only scratching the surface by what amazon is actually showing us but it already was was enough for us to make made several predictions in the past so one of the predictions that we've made in 2017 or 2018, I can't remember, I think 2018 or 19, was that Amazon was moving into relevancy, way more into relevancy. So not only like like search and how you rank your products to the top, but it was much more related to relevancy. Then we all, And then actually a year later, a year and a half later, everybody was talking about relevancy. And, and you know, and then it was the Amazon, uh, um, we call it the Amazon marketing machine, but in fact, it's the recommendation engine we found out how much sales is actually coming from the recommendation engine and not from search. Like everybody says like, okay, search, you know, it's search, it's search, I need to rank my keywords to the top. Well, everyone that ever did uh, uh, some checks about like, you know, combine all the keywords that you have, even if you, right now you have the, the search query performance reports, right? So you can see all your keywords, you can see all the traffic, you know, exactly the key, the searches, you know, the purchases. If you collect and you, you compute all those purchases, that's many times it's not only it's not just it, it's not even half of the total sales that you're doing for the product so where do the other sales come from right that was a question we had in the past and we figured it out in a very weird way so we had several products we we made our own tool set so we followed it and we followed the the, the, the sales trends the keyword ranking and then we found that somehow from one day to another day we we increased like 40 percent in sales and it stayed 40 percent more so like what happened and normally people say, yeah, that's the keyword rank. Well, if you look the moment that we realized five days later, it was the keyword rank. But then we checked back and we found out that what came first, it was not the keyword rank. It was the sales came first and then the keyword rank. It's like, where did the sales come from? We have scraped it. We have crawled the scrape that uh, crawl 150 million websites. We know exactly where our products and our brands actually uh, are being mentioned. Um, uh, so, so we dove in and we couldn't find anything until we actually found out like, a, but what if it's not? It's not search. What if Amazon has different ways where they actually get get uh, sales from? And that brought us to the Amazon marketing machine, uh, the recommendation engine, which is all the location. If you go to a product listing, you see the products uh, related to this item. They're frequently bought together. But also if you add a product to a cart, you see other products suggested for you, right? Then yeah. you have the emails from Amazon they send off to you. If you purchase one product, if you purchase diapers, then and, and Amazon knows that you have a baby because you 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 bought a pacifier like two weeks ago. What are they doing? They'll probably bombard you with like baby wipes, baby wipes, and baby wipes in emails, and sometimes a lot less uh, uh, obvious combinations of products. Amazon knows how many people are buying certain products uh, that buy certain products are also buying other products, so they bombard you with emails that you might think like, yeah, 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 I actually need that. Yeah, I need that. Yeah, they know that based on all the data. So that's the recommendation engine. A lot of sales is coming from the recommendation engine, right? And then also Amazon, they have the, the advertising. They spend budgets on Google advertising. I think they're the biggest advertiser on Google. And they do that on a category level, but they also do it on product levels. 
um, uh, that's interesting. And we that's the external, the outside traffic. But the recommendation engine was something very interesting. So we made a prediction there, like Amazon is going to in, in more in that direction, and it happened. And then last year we made a prediction about the Amazon search, like what will happen in search, because Amazon wants to get rid of those those uh, review mode driven products on top of search, dominating top of search. And the reason is that uh, new innovations do not have they, they cannot get a foot in the door uh, because because these old listings, they stick on top of search and they stay on top of search because they have the most traffic, they have the most sales and thus have the highest keyword rank. Um, but it's a problem for most people They buy products and Amazon sees that uh, many people, they are less satisfied with the high review uh, with the high review moded products compared to these newer products, sometimes with 500 reviews, 700 reviews, maybe even only 100 or 200 reviews, because those new innovations are built upon um, uh, the, the, the knowledge and history of these older products, right? And But the thing is that, that somehow these products does, don't rank. So Amazon, they said, we're going to fix this. This is a problem, we're going to fix this. And they called it the cold start problem. Right, the cold stock problem for a new product. We call it launch. The cold, they call it cold. The start. cold stock problem. Cold start. Cold start. Cold so it's, start. It's, okay, so cold, that yeah. where, when new products are coming in, they're not ranking because, or they're not ranking as fast because there's these other products that are, you know, review dominant, and then customers are buying them, but customers aren't as satisfied with them is what they're finding. Um, I'm sure they look at all the data, returns, uh, reviews, everything else. Um, and so they're trying to fix it through this cold start. So keep going. This is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, well, the, 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 cold start, the cold start is that's a new product coming to the market, right? The product is cold. Um, it comes to the market, but it doesn't rank. And Amazon doesn't know what to do with it. Well, they know they want to show it in search, but they don't know why and how. So that's the problem they had because the the the, the search engine was the, the way it works and it's it's way more complicated. But try to I'm trying to explain the simplified version. Like the the search is driven by a few factors and you mentioned a few just now. So it's it's reviews, it's returns, but it's also clicks. Clicks is one of the most important drivers. Clicks and and and, and sales, which is the conversion rate, right? Mm -hmm. So if a product has many clicks, high conversion rate um, is returned not that often, uh, but it. it well, it has this sales velocity, then it ranks on top of search, right? If the product also has a high re high review rate, and in 2021, or since 2020, mid-2020 until like end of 2021, um, the, we all see these spikes. Like it was the first time that this the review, request a review button came along, and you had sometimes up to a 10% review rate. So people, products that were selling well during those days, right now they gained like 50, 60, 70,000 reviews sometimes. So they stick on top of search and the perception of people is this product has a high review rate. So one of the most important things for people in, if they go to Amazon, like a buyer, right? They go to Amazon, they want to be certain they buy the right product, right? So that right. satisfaction, that's, that certainty is what they're looking for. What is the quick fix to certainty if they don't want to read? They don't want to read. They just want to pick a product. I'm, I'm looking for a silicon spatula. Which one to buy? I don't mind. This one has high review rate. Boom. I'm satisfied. If so many people like the product, I'm probably good, right? And yeah. don't have to look, look no further. So that keeps itself in place, right? So, but anyways, that that was the cold start problem is that Amazon says, oh, we want to fix this. And the way that we're going to fix this was on an algorithmic level. So we predicted a year ago, Amazon is going to fix this. And we said, um, I, I, I spoke on stage like in Mexico City and I told, I told a group of people, uh, I said, you know, in a year from now, two years from now, a lot of products that are right now on top of search, dominating, will fall from the pedestal. I'm for sure. I'm not sure when it will happen. I'm sure it will happen because of the documentation. So I've found. Why do you think that that's going to happen? So uh, my next question for you is, why do you think, I mean, Amazon for a while, they removed the review count from search. Yep, they did. But now it's back. Was, it's back. So, yeah. But it's, but the thing, you know, that, 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 that man, I can talk for hours. So about I know they're playing around with all of these different things, right? And and all of us are wondering, especially with, um, you know, what they're doing with AI as well, you know, and them suggesting changes to our listings with AI. We're wondering, are they going to enforce changes? Is search going to change to improve to include content and not just keywords, right? Is and that's what Google's doing, and Amazon has traditionally followed Google, right, in terms of 
of what the search algorithm looks like, but of course with their own unique spin converting at six times higher than any other e-commerce platform. But you know, if we're getting nerdy about this, I think it's fascinating and I agree with you that search is going to have to change and the way things dominate on Amazon is going to have to change. So what are your predictions about that, Miles? Do you think, what do you think might happen? Like if you had to paint the picture of how the products that are currently dominating now are going to fall, um, what, how do you think that will happen and why do you think that will happen? Uh, why it will happen is Amazon will follow the trends. And the, the thing is that tech is it's partly technology uh, technology driven, right? What is possible Amazon will do. What I actually want is make it as easy as possible for the people shopping. And AI is helping a lot with that. So what Amazon is working on right now is much more uh, conversational search, right? So that you say, hey, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm going on a hiking trip, right? What, what do I need? And then you see uh, hiking gear, shoes, and, and Amazon knows already what you bought in the past. So they know that if you were male, female, anything in between, what kind of colors you like, what kind of uh, sizes you have, if you ever bought shoes. So they know all this data. And what they're going to do, they're going to compile a search result based on your preferences, based on historical data, and the understanding of the search query, which is no longer a search query, but which, which is a contextual thing, right? So you can write a way longer sentence and Amazon actually will, with the BERT model, which is the bi-directional um, um, uh, trans, uh, transformer kind of thing. Which is, it's not new, it's for coming from Google since 2018. But that's, that's reading back and forth um, uh, a sentence and interpreting whatever you're writing, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to implement that on search and include in that your, your, your the customization based on, on, on your, your uh, historical preferences that Amazon knows about uh, from your historical purchases. And then they compile searches. So we believe, I believe what will happen, that search will be completely customized. So you will see completely different results as I see. And that will, well, we can all know what that, what, what that will do. Um, that means that there's the, the products that are currently on the pedestals will fall off because people are much more, I mean, not, not everybody likes these type of products, right? And more niche products, they will thrive in the niches wherever they've been built for. But that's my assumption. Um, but based on the, the, the documents we've seen. So there's a lot that's going to change. And the other thing as well is, and that's interesting, like Amazon is playing around with titles right now, right? So it was, I guess it was in some categories that Amazon played around with titles. If you did go on mobile, Suddenly, there was like the, the title was gone. It was like a five word title. Whatever Amazon interpreted, your product was about, right? And guess where they take the information from? It's not just from what is in your title, it's also from what is in your reviews, what is in your questions and answers. That's where they get the data from. And I made that prediction as well a year ago. I told people, like, it, the time will come and it's already there, right? If you have five to 10,000 reviews, and you take away all your bullet points. Do you think that your rank is gone? No, your rank is not gone. Amazon already know that you're relevant for certain keywords. You know where to get the, all the information from. And it's also, the other thing too is, if people write in the customer reviews a lot about certain words that you don't mention in your title, bullets, or wherever, wherever Amazon is already indexing you for those keywords. And that's, they are implementing that much more right now, right? And they call and it the- have you seen have you seen you know what they're doing with reviews so i'm on this this uh landing page for a for some training gloves on amazon they have over 29,000 reviews and amazon is now showing these ai summarized reviews um but this is actually hurting some sellers because the ai description of the reviews is inaccurate um, and says things that don't describe the product or, you know, whatever. And, um, and it's actually hurt a lot of sellers. So it sounds like the way you're, you're predicting it's going to go is that, you know, Amazon's going to kind of force these changes on our listings or index us for keywords that right now we have more control over what keywords we're indexed for. We can kind of play around with our ads. So two key changes that I've recently learned about. The first one is that uh, Ritu Java during our um, Southern Seller Fest event 
mention that exact match ad campaigns, exact match is no longer acting like exact match. So if you go into your search terms reports for your ads, um, you'll see that exact match is now acting more like broad match. <laughs> and your, your ads are being shown for keywords that are not matching your exact match. So that's but that you know you know you know what that is that's the that's the query rewriting models that Amazon implemented. So query rewriting like what we think is like a, an exact match keyword like 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 you know there's a lot of words that look to get that look like each other. So Amazon they have these rewriting models and they put it into buckets. They know that if someone is looking for silicon spatula or spelicon, uh, 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 spatula silicon is actually the same keyword. So whatever you do, like like focusing on these specific keywords, Amazon puts them in the same bucket anyway. So that's what exact match is going to. And now they get a conflict with the exact match uh, terminology that they have in ads and their own algorithm that has that that sees it another way. So somehow they mix it up and then it splits it again into your into your uh, in your advertising uh, reports. And that's where the conflict comes from, right? So there you don't see it. It fits in the bucket because Amazon will show you the buckets. But that, that's what's actually happening. Amazon is implementing way more things in the background than we, we actually think of. And what you mentioned about the reviews and about the, 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 the analysis of the reviews, that's what the front end is doing, right? In the back end, they already have these models. Like if you go to Amazon Comprehend, for example, is an AI, uh, an AI that we use as well for some of our tools to make a, a analysis of sentiments uh, on some videos that we scrape and stuff like that. So we have sentiment analysis. We use it already for, I think, a year and a half, two years. Um, but now they use that as well. So they can actually see in what likelihood um, uh, customers are talking about certain products and certain keywords. Well, and, and we're seeing that in uh, Amazon's product Opportunity Explorer too. They just added um, more information about each product and summaries of reviews and you know what customers like about a niche, what they don't like um, underneath a certain keyword. It, that's been really interesting. But this... This recent thing that um, that Faye Sauter brought up, she got this email from Amazon, and I just want to show it. This is was featured in um, in Kevin King's latest Billion Dollar Sellers newsletter, and um, <laughs> Faye got this email from Amazon that said, "You know, dear seller, we're plot we're piloting a new program to leverage the power of AI to generate richer product listings." and have enriched the product content of some of the ASINs in your brand's catalog. We have not yet published the recommended attribute values for your ASINs, as you are the owner of the ASINs. We need you to review the content and provide feedback, agree or disagree, by the scheduled publishing date. So this is interesting. They're piloting a new program. So Faye logs in and checks out this listing, uh, these listings that Amazon has automatically edited and she says it's they're awful. Like the, the information's not correct at all. So I wonder how much of this control, you know, is gonna be completely removed from the seller. Right now, we know how to rank. We know how to index for certain keywords. We know how to play the game, right? But how much is the game changing and how much is Amazon going to kind of take over and go, nope, this is how you're going to be shown in search. You know, when we think about exact match, no longer performing like exact match, how do we even ensure the proper indexing of our keywords? And does that even matter anymore if at some point Amazon's only going to index what they want to index or only going to show your products to who they think based on their AI or their, you know, algorithm, their predictions, it should be shown to. What do you think about this? Do you think it's going to be for well, us and we're going to lose our ability to rank? Um, it, it depends. Like what you see at your ability to rank, like the control over keywords is going to fade. Yeah. I mean, what we do now, we write the titles and the bullets and the stuff. Of course, they they still need that, right? I mean, they need an, the, the description of the product. And they call that, you know, in technical terms, they have the behavioral features and non-behavioral features. They call it the non-behavioral features. That's information you feed into Amazon that actually showcases what is this product about. And I believe that if whatever you write, like mm -hmm. whatever you write on your listing, your title, your bullets and stuff, it will also be always be important because otherwise Amazon has no way to detecting what this product is about. But from the moment they understand what this product is about, they'll 
whatever changes you might make, or maybe you can make changes that do it again. I don't know about that, but along the way, what will actually drive uh, the search completely is that Amazon is checking your product with your images, like image title, the 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 the, the price. They show it to customers on various keywords. They already do that. They call it the spear phishing method. They just take your product and put it up in search like a day or, or maybe sometimes a couple of minutes to just get some clicks and see how well you're performing until they get a critical mass of data and they can see, hey, your product is performing worse or better compared to competition that's now ranking on top of those searches, right? That's the methodology that I've, re I've read about it, like I think it was over a year, like early this year, late last year, don't get me wrong. Um, it's always a question when they write about it in the documents, when will it be implemented, right? But it sounded to me that they were already doing that for a while. But that's what they do. So they they take your, uh, your product, show it for a certain keyword on top of search or at, somewhere in search, and then they see if you actually perform well or not. So then what is then important to do? Like the control of your listing might, might fade for a part. But if you sell the product the right way on your listing, like in your image, main image, the secondary, the image tag, and the video, and your EBC. And I think that the EBC even is like for most products not that important to be honest. Like I think it's I'm not thinking uh, based on data it's overrated. Any product under twenty five dollars should not pay too much attention on, on unless it's a very specific product with a specific use case. Anyways, um, but if you that's why if you do it correctly you have to do it correctly from day one, and th th that's yeah. what we are working on already for a long time. We say I want to have the right product. For the right customer, I had no. I need to know exactly what my customer wants. I need to make my listing exactly as per what my customer would like to see. So if I know who my customer is and I know what I like to see, and I make the listing correctly, the images, the visualization, Amazon is not going to do that for you, right? Then I know I can sell. I have the right storyline in my in my images. I have the right storyline in my video. I know how to sell this product. Then what happens if Amazon shows that product on top of search? That's a nice image actually telling a story it's not that the colors are better is that it it airs a story it communicates a story to the visitor they're like okay that i'm 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 a typical customer i would like to see the product i click on the product i go to i see the image tag wow this is actually talking to me i i am in need and you talk to me exactly what i expect to see then i see the video i'm like i'm sold i need to buy like i buy this product right so that's where you have control over the messaging and i i think that over 90% of sellers, they still live based on those old um, uh, courses of like, you know, just slap an image on it, ask a designer, look to what your competition is doing, do exactly the same thing. And then they, you know who they copied the listings from? From these review moated products. They are selling since 2016, 2017 mm -hmm. from the Stone Age, right? So whatever makes them selling, it's not the imagery. So if you as a new listing are copying their old crap, you can never rank, right? Because Amazon already knows that product is not selling based on the message, it's based on the reviews and, and the good price. That's why they sell. And they are so ingrained into the algorithm that they have every spot in the recommendation as you can think of. They dominate that. It's not that. about the images, it's about the trust and the authority in those reviews and you know the ranking. And now Amazon saying on each product, 300 of these are selling a month. That I thought was a really big change you know they changed this um they changed the what the buy box looks like what search looks like and now you see the reviews you see the price you see the promotions you see the main image um and then you also see how many of these products sell a month and me as a shopper that also plays into whether i purchase a product or not because you know we're talking about the what was it the cold start right i mean the thing is like if Amazon's also going to say that this one's selling 300 a month, you know, it's cool if it doesn't have as many reviews, but if this one's selling 300 a month and this one's only selling 50 a month, I'm probably going to buy the one that's 300 a month because that's what everybody's buying, right? So it plays into the trust. But I agree with you. If you're going to pay for clicks and you're going to, or not pay for clicks, get a click at all and somebody comes to your listing um, I review listings, you know, people, I have a free listing review service. You guys can go over to amazingathome.com and you can click on my free listing review underneath the services menu and you can send me your listing and I'll send you a video of me going through your listing. And I'm a nerd about conversion optimization. And 
I think the same thing as Mel's does here about you got to do it right from the beginning because it affects everything that you do. And most people, as you were saying, Mel's, they're not telling a story. They're not connecting with their customer. I don't even know. Like what I do when I review a listing is the same thing a shopper is going to do. They're going to kind of look at your title a little bit just to kind of get it in your, their brain. They're going to ignore the bullet points, ignore the, the writing. They're going to go through those main images. And if you don't sell them on those main images, if they have questions, they don't understand what it is. There's a million other products <laughs> right there waiting to be clicked on. You got to sell them from the start. And I agree. Uh, it's like so many sellers don't actually understand their customer, who they're selling to. I think they're just looking for the product that's going to make them the money, but they're not connecting with the customers. <laughs> so can we talk about your, your process for setting up the foundation? Like what I have a seven photo strategy that I use that follows the customer's um, buying mindset. But I would love to hear your strategy. How do oh. you plan content? How do you do that research to establish that connection? Well, we have, we, 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 we build in Tel Aviv exactly for that reason. So what we do, we, we, we want to listen to consumers. So we figure out who is my consumer, what kind of age range, is there a specific age range, uh, certain demographics, do they have a specific disease if they're ill, like is it diabetes, do they, have, do they have pets, what kind of pet, do they have a long haired dog or a short haired dog, whatever kind of, you know, what kind of customer you're talking to. And we select those from a pool of 28 million people. And then we have like three campaigns we start with. And I just, I don't go into the campaign talk, but more about the, the methodology, right? One of the things that I'm, I'm I'm obsessed about is drab, drab, I D R A B, and I learned about that from from Anthony Robbins. He he, he had a course about influencing people. Um, I I don't know how many years years ago I I I, I learned about it, but he talks talks about several things. So there's emotional reasons to buy now, there's logical reasons to buy now, and there's dominant reasons to avoid buying. And that third one is so important. If you know why people are not buying a certain product, right? And mo most sellers on Amazon, they don't have a clue. We talk to sellers that sell product for seven years and do very high numbers. And then we do one of those drab campaigns, what we call it. And we ask like 125 people why they would not buy a certain product like this. And they tell like, yeah, I'm not sure if, you know, this is actually, you know, fits into my dishwasher. Or, or I'm not sure if, if you know, if this is sturdy enough for X, Y, Z. Um, and then these sellers like, I'm selling this product for so long. I, I've, I've seen so many customer reviews. I never saw about this. I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, customer reviews is post-purchase experience. Like what you need to know is a pre-purchase decision driver. That's completely different, right? There's a different. Of course, you should check reviews from from others. Like that, that's learning you a ton. But you, you never find a pre-purchase decision drivers. And what you see sometimes that but people they take stuff from customer reviews and they put it into their title. This th this one is so strong it will not break. Who cares? I mean, people are not buying it. Does it break? I mean, expect people it not to break. Right? Quality. That's the they thing. Expect, but they the thing quality. is that they got it. They got it from the reviews from other products, their competitors. So they think, okay, I have to avoid it. I put it into my listing. No, that's bad. I mean, that it might not be in the mind of the people until they bought the product and it breaks, then it's bad, right? Uh, but the pre-purchase decision driver is why are people, what are people thinking about in their subconscious mind if they start buying a product? So what are these objections, the buying objections? If you know the objections and actually you can put into your, your main image, like we did it for a pet product recently. It was like, and many people, they said, I'm not sure if my vet would recommend it. Like, wow. Okay, cool. Could you get like a vet to recommend this product, right? It, if it's vet recommended, that that's sometimes easy to do. Go to your vet, talk to him. If he wants to recommend it, you can mention it's vet recommended because your vet recommended it, right? So th th those things that you might add that are not that obvious, that's what we want to learn first. So that's one. So drab. We want to focus on the drab parts. And then also the second is if 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 I show different products in the marketplace, right? So that's another campaign we have in Intel. If you show like five different products in the market, the five competitors or potential competitors because I'm not selling the product yet, right? Just five listings. And we have the 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 main image, we have the price, we have the title, we have the uh, the reviews. 
So those things we show. And then may, many times we blur out the reviews because that is too high of an influence. And then we send people to the listing. And before we actually send people to the listing, and it's the same type of audience, and then we, 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 we put them into some kind of a framing state because, because you're sending people that are not wanting to buy the products to say something about the products, right? So we say, okay, we put them into a situation, like the awareness situation. Okay, you have a problem, you're problem aware, and you're already solution aware because in solution aware customers are going to Amazon. If people are not looking for a solution, they're not going to Amazon. They go to Google, right? Um, and that's where the keyword, keywords come from. People, someone typing in silicon spatula, they already know that they're looking for a silicon spatula. That's where the keyword comes from. Um, so they, they, they are solution aware. So we put them into that situation. So what is the normal situation when someone is buying a silicon spatula? Well, people think like, I want to have the most fancy silicon. No, 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 no. That's not the case. Some, the spatula is broke. Or they just want to replace this set because it, it, you know, it, it I don't know, it, it's outdated or whatever. So they go to Amazon and just buy a darn set of spatulas, right? It's not more than that. And I think that's 80% of the people. So, yeah. but, but then, then they see all these options. So then what happens in their mind? There might be some objections. Like, is this the right product I'm buying? Is always the thing. Is this the right product I can pick from? So if you know some kind of objections that people might have, and you can counter those objections into your listing, you're already a winner. But then the thing is, if you want to know, like if, 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 so that's the other comment. We show five products in a row. We stage people in the situation. Then we ask them the question, right? Then we show them the products and ask them the question. Which of these products would you buy and why? And they're like, I would buy that one. Okay, great. That's great. And then we ask them like, which of these would you not buy and why? And then they give the negative side. And that's an interesting thing because most people are seven times more likely to talk about negative stuff than about positive stuff. I mean, if you're on a birthday party or any any event and you, you bump into someone, what's great about your day? Mwah, the weather is nice. And then it's done. If you talk about what is bad about your day? Well, don't get me started, right? I can talk for hours about how bad my day is. People are more likely to air their negativity than their positivity. So the negative side we take a lot of from the negative elements. Like, why are people choosing, not choosing a specific product? Then we take all that information, put it into a blender, and then we see, okay, if you want to make a product, we should avoid all the negatives, and we should add many of the positives, and that's already the inspiration we have for a product listing or sometimes even a product, because we always start at the beginning before we actually uh, source a product. And so that, that's how we do it. And, that, and the, the funny thing is that by doing this, we right now are on a... Uh, journey, getting a, a brand new brand. So we started a new brand, new seller account early this year. It's a one product brand. And we specifically took a category where everybody in every course says, don't go sell in this category. <laughs> so we did research and we said, okay, we're going to take this product from zero to eight figures in 12 months time. That means that in next month, we're going to do $850,000 in revenue, which is a new brand, right? We had all the restrictions of inventory in the beginning as well. We had the blockage of like over $25,000 sold, but it's possible. And it would be a test case. The only problem is that we found out that that someone that ended up signing up for our tool is also one of the biggest competitors. So we're kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> tense to talk about it. So and then you're like, we, still oh, do it. we don't want to make it look like we're, you, you know. know. true. And, and also, I don't want, and he's also speaking on stage and I'm speaking on stage here and there. So yeah, I don't <laughs> want to make this like a public fight. So that's why uh, when we met the goal- well, then public probably, fights are fun. <laughs> I know, I, you know, yeah. I have I don't to know, know is it Aaron Cordova's? <laughs> <laughs> because when you said it's a competitive product, I'm like, is it a garlic press or a lemon squeezer? <laughs> yeah, everybody thinks that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's it's any of those products. If you continue to listen, I keep saying no, then probably you'll find the right product. Yeah. Uh, but no, no, it's, well, yeah. Aaron is a great friend of mine. He's a great guy. Um, But but anyways, it is it is one of those products. But the, the thing is that we found something and we found a specific thing that people mentioned, like, hey, uh, you know, I'm not sure if this product XYZ is okay. Nobody does that. Mm -hmm. and, and other things as well. Like this, there's there's this interesting stuff. Some people, sometimes you find out that people are, have concerns about something that everybody has. We have another product in another brand where our manufacturer came to us and they said, you know, we right now have like seven features and it's a product for like 50 uh, you know, people over 50. This had seven features. And all the rest, has, all, all the other competitors have six features. We have seven, so this is better for the market. And we did like blah blah blah. We're like, okay, well, let let's just talk to the audience. So we start talking to the audience. The first thing they said, all these products look so complicated. We're like, wow, okay, great. So we kept asking, like, what do you want to see? It should be easy to understand. 
And that was all people over 50. So we're like, okay, great. So strip um, five options and just get it down to two. The manufacturer said, you're crazy. This is not going to sell. We do this already for 25 years. We know where the market is going. We said, no matter what, just do it for us. Two features, that's it. Simple. So we saved on cost tremendously. It was very cheap. Um, and, and the product became not the best seller, but in the top the top three uh, of the category. How? Because we, we, we listened to the consumer, right? We knew what drove them, what the pre-purchase decision drivers were, what the objections were. We knew where they, if we, and we always showcased it. Like we started the product when we started developing it. First, we actually created like a, a mock-up, put it into an image and an image tag, created the campaign, asked like 150 people about it, and they massively clicked this product. So we knew beforehand that, that among the products presented, they were picking this product, right? So it was not that we're driving blind. We did it based on data. So that was... Yeah. But yeah, that's how we that's how we go about like like you know launching products and making great listings, listening to consumers and finding that information. For us, like it's it's like a it's like a roadmap. And right now in in Delhi, we're trying to educate people. A lot of sellers don't understand it. They use it just like any other split testing tool that they have. But we we created this not for being a clone of like any of the other tools out there, but much more to get in depth, much more in depth about the drivers of the consumers, and and that's what we're doing. And that we do the same it. thing for the image tech as well. So we have three image techs next to each other. So we say, and then we have the same thing. Which of these products would you buy and why? And then also, and which of these images in the these image. stacks? Was that? Just by looking at the images, which of these just, products would you buy? Which is so exactly. important because that's True. people and, shop with their eyes. They're, and, you know, we've got so many video shopping platforms growing, you know. So imagery is so important. And I think that, um, being able to tell a story very quickly and easily and people get it right away and you're you're not doing too text heavy you're like you're getting in their brain and you're talking about the things that matter to them that True. is what is key and I love what you guys are doing in terms of you know there's it's one thing to put a poll out there right but what I see a lot of times when people use polling software is that they're not asking the right questions so, you know, they're like, yeah, I ran a poll and people said that they would pick this one. But hang on. Did you compare this one with like what data did you put out there? Like you said, you add like five of the top of the price. You know, you hide the reviews, but you, you know, the image, you know, some different information. What did you show? Because if you just showed a picture of two different products and you say, which one would you buy? It doesn't tell you anything about it, right? So I love that you're you're pulling at a deeper level. You're finding out not only why would you buy it, why wouldn't you buy it? A lot of sellers also, they differentiate in ways that don't matter to the customer. So they add extra features that don't matter. And sometimes a customer just wants the simple thing. They just want the spatula. <laughs> they just well, want the spatula that works, that's a good price, you know? And so it's like, you know, you added an extra thingamabob to your spatula or you added kitchen knives to your spatula set, but customers don't want that. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, I, I think sometimes- It might be, but then test, test it. We yeah. don't like test it out. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't, right? But don't go and spend your money, uh, you know, on any change without validation. Like, and you know, and also, but we always start with the ideation. Where does the ideation start? The for us, the ideation starts in the brain of the consumer. So that's why yes. we listen to them, right? So I can come up with all my gut feelings, right? And I can think, I think this is right. Well, the the times I've been wrong, um, you know, way too much. It's costing me way too much money. And yeah, I was talk about say, like the times we're wrong is super expensive. And today we really, with AI today, we have no excuse not to poll first because today I can create an image of whatever product I'm thinking of, whatever product I've done some research on, I'm in the customer's brain, right? And I'm like, I think they want this based on the data. I think this is what they want. I don't even need to build a prototype or have a sample sent to me. I can literally visualize that, put it in a poll. I mean, why not get the data first and then let that drive your decisions? And then you That's can the go thing. back to, you can actually get your samples made and everything based on the data, that feedback. So you know why customers are gonna buy. I love how you brought up why they're not gonna buy um, and having that data in the beginning. And 
I had no idea of that in Tel Aviv was doing that. So I'm so glad that you know we got to talk about this Love today. That. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's well, we 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 just started it as a SaaS, but you we do it for five years already, so it was it's kind of tough to get it in the brains of others. I'm glad to see it here, like the 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 way that you're doing it, I love it. I think you and I should talk more um, <laughs> about this topic. And and what you say is right, like the questions that people ask, and we see the same thing happening in Intellivision. So don't get me wrong, we try to to get it done as good as possible, but. You know, we got our help from from like industry specialists. We have a guy which is a PhD of a university in Washington. He helped us out to like the bias and framing part. Like bias and framing are two very important topics. Like if you put something out, and we have a campaign for that that you can, where you can actually see that. If if the setting changes, the people's the people's behavior changes as well. So that's why we we simulate a marketplace. We take products that are out there that are like ours, right? And then we we ask them the question. It have to look that's the the, the subconscious and the conscious framing. But then bias, like if you, if that, that's what's happening a lot in, in whatever polling tools people are using, take like five white items and then one black one. Which one do you think the people will choose? The black one, because the one that stands out from the rest, right? But if you take yeah. a pink one, it will be the pink one, right? If you have two black ones and three white ones, then it becomes a little bit harder. So you have to mingle the options as well. So there's much more into that uh, than, than just putting yeah, something out something... and asking a few people. Something that I was talking, I'm looking around because I think I have a, one of these around, laying around. I created with a client of mine who does who sells wallets. We created uh, with AI a wallet based on a mid-century modern office chair uh, with the wood grain. So we created a black wallet with the wood grain and a, a gray wallet with like more of a rustic wood grain. And we actually had the samples made. Um, we generated the images first with AI, and then uh, we pulled an audience to figure out what they wanted. Then we had the samples made and took pictures of the real samples, just so that, because sometimes the AI generation will look different than the real samples. And we learned that customers would pay $70 for the black version that was more like that mid-century modern office chair and $20 for the gray version, which is more in line with um, you know, normal wallet prices today. But then also what we did, we didn't just pull, first we pulled just the options of the wallets with the wood grain in them. Then we ran other polls of which one do you like, the wallet with the wood grain or the classic regular wallet, right? Which one would you choose and why? You know, And then asking how much would you pay for it? is important because it's, you know, it's their perception of the value of that product. Um, so I love that you guys are, are doing this on so many levels. And I think it's so important, not only to, we have to ask the right questions in our polls. We have to learn what they like, what they don't like. We also have to compare, like you said, like if we put for all, all a bunch of wood grain wallets. Well, cool. They, they picked the black one. They really like the black one. Right. But if we, then compare that with, if we never compare that with the normal wallets that they can choose from, we don't know if they would even choose one with wood grain, right? Maybe everybody exactly. in a poll is gonna, you know, and it was about 50%. So it was still worth it to launch it for us because we were like, okay, well, if we can get half of that market choosing this wallet, great. But we put two of the very classic best-selling colors next to the best pulled wood grain designs that we created. And we learned that 50% would choose a wood grain design. So it was still worth it to launch. But had we never done that poll and just assumed that, you know, it it's be, like, can be very we have, yeah, we have to compare it across the board. So I think it's, it's so awesome. So what I've learned from you today, Mel's, is that no matter the changes, no matter what's happening on Amazon, no matter how volatile our data gets and we don't know what's going on or, you know, how we're ranking, um, we have control over the presentation that we put forth to the customer. We have control over our visuals. We have control over what the products we create and how we sell them and how we tell the story about those products. And what I've learned from you today is that it's really important that we get that data early and that we're designing our products and our brands based on, you know, their customer centric, their customer focus, and we're designing them based on actual data and not just our gut feeling of what we think looks good. Um, and not just based on those products that have all the reviews, 
Um, and that's something that hopefully we continue to always have control over and will always drive sales. I hope so. There's never guarantees, right? And the, the other thing to the, the other thing is video. I think video is another thing that we, I think we will have control over. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. a whole different topic. If we talk about video, like we have campaigns for that. <laughs> we just have to topic. have another, we need to have another content session together where we talk about conversion optimization, because I think that, you know, that oh, yeah. would be great. Well, Thank you so much, Mel's, for being here today and for just having a nerdy conversation with me. I enjoyed this so much. If you can, yeah, tell it got kind of technical, so uh, sorry about that. But <laughs> sometimes <laughs> you never it, have it to did. Apologize but, uh, for that. We like the technical stuff too. Um, but you know, would you tell everybody a little bit more about how they can follow you and then how they can give Intellivy a try? Um, how they can follow me, they can go to Facebook, they can go to LinkedIn. Uh, Mel Starlow, there's not many of my uh, uh, of me, and you probably remember the the, the image of my face. Uh, and in Tel Aviv, I just sign up for intelavi.net. Uh, you can create like a free account. The thing is that we are not yet a full-fledged SaaS service, right? It, it's, we're constantly in the making, constantly improving. And one thing that's lacking, we definitely have to invest in that, and we plan that for the next two, three months, is a training section. Because training... Like the education is 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 super important, and we had the assumption because we did this for five years with uh, with uh, like the, the the bigger sellers in the industry, 60, 70 sellers in the, uh, in the industry, totally have like three hundred brands. Um, they know how to do it, right? So then we did go live, like okay, everybody understands it. Well, people's perception was completely different. So we need to educate more. So if you go in and something is not clear. Simply schedule a call, right? Schedule a 30, 30 minute call. Uh, we have a team here that can help you out. We can actually train teams as well. Um, uh, so just don't send it just over to your designer to figure it out because that's not how it works. In Aviv is not just the designs, it's much more the knowledge underneath the product. Um, but yeah, we, we're here to help. So you can reach out to me, um, preferably to my team. My schedule is already very full. But anyways, we're here to help. And um, just go and check out Intelavi.net. I love it. I would love to also do an IntelliV uh, cool tool feature in the future. I'd love to just get in there and, and dig into uh, everything you guys yeah. are doing behind the scenes. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for listening today and tuning in and, um, and being here for another Wisdom Wednesday. Thank you, Mel's, for being here as well. And everybody go and check out IntelliV. Mel says it's free. So it sounds like a pretty cool tool and it might not be free for long. So <laughs> I'd go check it out and see what they got going on over there and book a call. If, if you have questions, that's such an awesome offer, especially coming um, from people with this kind of reputation and experience doing these things. So let's make better decisions. Let's build better products. And we'll see you guys next time on Wednesday Wisdom. Bye, everybody. Bye.